Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I was eager to get my first car. Being 19 with a fresh license, I scored listings for cheap rides so I could finally ditch the bus. Most were rusted out jokers barely held together by duct tape and luck. But one Craigslist ad caught my hopeful eye. A 1999 Civic with only 112,000 miles. And a $900 price tag fit right in my shoestring budget. This could be my ticket to freedom. I messaged the seller immediately and we arranged to meet that afternoon. As I caught the bus across town, excitement mounted. No more standing in the rain or sitting next to weirdos. No more 30 minute walks home from my retail job after dark. Only my own car represented a passport to the independent adult life I craved. I hopped off in a rough part of town full of vacant buildings and sketchy alleyways. Unease prickled as I double-checked the meeting address, an abandoned warehouse on the edge of a vacant lot. An odd spot for a test drive, but maybe the guy needed room to show off the car. I spotted a red Civic parked outside, so at least he hadn't given me a phony address. As I approached, a tall figure stepped from the shadows. He looked sly and jittery, but had kind eyes underneath the nervous energy. Sticking out his hand, he introduced himself as James. I explained my interest in the Civic, and he nodded enthusiastically, saying he was the original owner but needed cash quick to pay some bills. He led me over to the car, extolling its reliability and great gas mileage. Aside from some minor scratches, everything looked well maintained. James even provided recent service records. At only $900, this Civic was an absolute steal. We took it for a short test drive with James encouraging me to open it up on the straightaway. It handled smooth as silk. Inside and out, the car seemed almost too good to be true, just like the ad promised. After parking back at the warehouse, I told James on the spot that I'd take it. We stepped inside the dim warehouse to fill out the paperwork. Dusty boxes were stacked almost to the ceiling in rows, creating a narrow path back to a cramped office area. I felt a twinge of hesitation seeing this shady building as James' base of operations. But so far he had been nothing but polite. I probably just watched too many crime shows that made me paranoid of strangers. Still, my senses remained on high alert as I followed him back towards his makeshift office, my footsteps echoing sharply down the narrow passage. Inside the small room, a single bulb hung from the ceiling casting harsh light over a cheap metal desk. James gestured me into a rickety chair while he dug through piles of crazy receipts and old parts manuals scattered about. Before I could sit down fully, searing pain erupted through my skull as James cracked me across the back of the head. Darkness swirled instantly. I collapsed helpless to the cold concrete floor, clinging desperately to consciousness. James' polite facade vanished, replaced by wild desperation. He kicked me viciously in the ribs, screaming to give him my wallet. Fighting to stay awake against the debilitating agony, I fumbled it from my jeans with shaking hands. This was no sale. James was a violent crook who lured cash-strapped prey like me to this remote spot to rob them. Maybe worse judging by the crazed look in his eyes. Fear shot adrenaline through my system. I needed to escape or who knows what he might do to me. James rifled greedily through my wallet, lobbing cards and photos across the room. His face twisted in disgust, finding only $17 cash inside. Hardly enough for a tank of gas. He leaned down inches from my face, hot breath reeking of stale cigarettes. Shouting furiously, he blamed me for wasting his time dragging my worthless, broke ass across town. My mouth went dry hearing those venomous words, realizing he saw me as more disposable nuisance than fellow human. Panic rising, I made subtle moves inspecting possible escape routes while James ranted. But there was only one way in or out of that narrow warehouse corridor. Unless I could overpower James, somehow I was trapped. Each frantic heartbeat heightened the terrifying reality. No one knew where I was, and a violent, unstable stranger stood between me and the exit. I needed to placate him and buy time. I sputtered desperate excuses. The money must have fallen out in my apartment. I had to call my roommate to confirm. James paused, uncertain whether to buy my act. 
Capitalizing on that split second of hesitation, I made my move. With every ounce I could muster, I swept James' feet from under him. He crashed down cursing as I leaped up, sprinting for freedom. My only thought to make it back outside so passersby might see me. Blinding pain throbbed through my skull, slowing me down. I heard James stagger back up, his shuffling footsteps gaining rapidly. Thirty yards to daylight. I pushed harder. Twenty yards up, James' hand grazed the back of my shirt. Terror fueled my final sprint, just as hands clamped down ferociously, wrenching me backwards. We crashed to the concrete floor, a tangle of limbs writhing violently. I thrashed with animal ferocity, kicks and elbows landing wherever possible. James clawed at my face, trying to subdue me, but rage and adrenaline made me almost inhumanly strong. With a primal roar, I broke free, my shirt tearing as I crawled desperately towards freedom. Sunlight flooded my vision as I burst outside, sweet relief washing over me. My screams brought help instantly from a homeless woman camped nearby. With wide eyes, she pulled me to safety down in 911. In minutes, police swarmed as I recounted the ambush, barely able to form words between panic sobs. As the adrenaline hide crashed down, delayed shocks that had seen hints of blood splatter on the ripped clothing. Soon enough officers dragged a handcuffed James outside. Face swollen and lip bloody from our fight, he averted his eyes from mine. Provoto gone, he looked like nothing more than a strung out pumpkin over his head. Just another anonymous low life who almost ruined an innocent life over a few bucks. As he disappeared into the cruiser, profound relief finally settled on my shoulders. Against all odds, I had escaped becoming just another missing person's case on the evening news. Beaten and bruised, no doubt I would spend years working past deep wounds, today's trauma etched. But thanks to that one last ditch effort, I would heal and live. It all started on a lazy Sunday afternoon, when I was killing time by scrolling through the ads on Craigslist. I know I know it's not exactly the safest place to be doing your shopping, but what can I say? I'm a sucker for a good deal. And that's when I saw it. An ad for an antique jewelry box, complete with a whole bunch of vintage rings. The price was so low, it was almost laughable. I mean, we're talking pennies on the dollar here. But the seller had included some pretty convincing photos, and I could see that the box was a real beauty. Sure, it had a few dings and scratches, but that just added to its charm, you know. I shot off a message to the seller before I could talk myself out of it. I half expected to get a reply saying that the box was already sold, or that the price was a typo. But to my surprise, they got back to me almost immediately, saying that the box was still available and that they could even deliver it to my doorstep. I mean, how could I resist an offer like that? We arranged to meet up later that day, and I spent the next few hours practically buzzing with excitement. I kept imagining all the hidden treasures that might be waiting for me inside that box, the stories those old rings could tell, the history they had witnessed. I even started planning out how I was going to display them, maybe in a little shadow ox or something. When the seller finally pulled up in front of my house, I practically sprinted outside to meet them. They were an older gentleman with a kind face and a viva belly. He seemed harmless enough, and he had a friendly smile as he handed over the jewelry box, all wrapped up in a plastic bag. I couldn't wait to get inside and start rummaging through my new treasure. I thanked the seller profusely and headed back into my house, my heart pounding with anticipation. I felt like a kid on Christmas morning, just itching to tear into that box and see what goodies were waiting for me. As soon as I got up to my room, I ripped open the plastic bag and lifted the lid of the box with trembling fingers. And there they were, a dozen or so antique rings, nestled in the faded velvet lining like little glittering jewels. They were even more stunning than I had imagined with intricate designs and sparkling gemstones that caught the light just so. But as I started to sort through the rings, marveling at each one in turn, I noticed something strange. There, tucked away at the bottom of the box, was a small, wrapped bundle. It was about the size and shape of a human finger, and it was covered in what looked like old, yellowed tape. At first, I thought it must be some kind of jewelry roll or something. But as I looked closer, I felt a creeping sense of unease start to build in the pit of my stomach. Something about that little bundle just didn't feel right. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should just leave it alone. But curiosity got the better of me, and I carefully peeled back the tape with shaking hands, my breath catching in my throat. And that's when I saw it. 
a human finger severed at the knuckle that's skin gray and shriveled like an old prune. I let out a scream that probably could have woken the dead, dropping the box and stumbling backwards in horror. For a moment, I just stood there, my mind reeling, trying to process what I had just seen. Who in their right mind would put a human finger in a jewelry box? And why? What kind of sick, twisted individual would do something like that? I felt like I was going to be sick. My stomach turned and my head spun, and for a moment I thought I might actually pass out. But somehow I managed to keep it together long enough to fumble for my phone and dial the cops with shaking fingers. I stammered out my story to the operator, my voice cracking with fear and revulsion. They promised to send someone right away, and I spent the next 20 minutes pacing back and forth across my bedroom floor, trying not to look at the box that lay there like a ticking time bomb. When the police finally arrived, they took one look at the severed finger and called in the cavalry. Before I knew it, my room was swarming with crime scene investigators, all of them poking and prodding at the box and its grisly contents like it was just another day at the office. They questioned me for hours, asking me about the seller and the transaction and every little detail I could remember. I told them everything I knew, but it wasn't much. The seller had seemed so normal, so average. How could I have known what kind of horrors were lurking inside that innocent-looking box? In the end, it took the box and the finger away as evidence, leaving me alone with my thoughts and my nightmares. I couldn't sleep for weeks after that, couldn't close my eyes without seeing that shriveled gray finger staring back at me. I never did find out the whole story behind the finger in the box. The police investigated, but they never found the seller. It was like he had vanished into thin air, leaving behind nothing but a trail of unanswered questions and a whole lot of trauma. But until then, my friends, stay safe out there, keep your guard up and your lie detector on high alert. And remember, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Trust me, I learned that lesson the hard way. Hey guys, sorry for interrupting, but just a quick announcement. First of all, if you're still listening, then you're amazing. Thank you for listening and supporting. Our team worked tirelessly day and night to produce these amazing stories for you. That's why we set up a Buy Me a Coffee page where you can show your support by generously donating a coffee or two to our team to keep us energized. It isn't much, but will surely go a long way. It's totally your choice, but would be absolutely amazing if you could. Again, thank you for your support. The link is in the bio and comments. Back to the stories. When my boyfriend Sam and I moved into our cozy starter home last fall, most furnishings had to come secondhand as we budgeted for renovations. So I obsessively scored Craigslist posts featuring more and yet stylish pieces to match the Cape Cod Cottage's codgecore vibe on a shoestring. One misty Saturday, an ad appeared displaying a distressed oak dresser priced almost too reasonably from an elderly man clearing estate furniture. Charmed by its chippy patina despite strange symbols etched faintly upon each drawer, I claimed the Victorian antique instantly, scheduling Saturday delivery. Soon a rickety truck arrived hauling the stately armoire. As the wrinkled driver unloaded it gingerly, Sam noticed his calloused hands missed a couple fingers. Chalking it up to past work accident, I tipped him before eagerly installing the dresser in our bedroom, admiring its heirloom gravitas contrasting the Ikea nightstands. That night, however, I stirred from vivid nightmares of being trapped screaming inside small suffocating spaces. Shaken by sensations lingering too real, I calmed nerves reminding myself we simply needed adjust to the aged manner's unfamiliar creaks and dips compared to our old shoebox apartment. Sam mumbled about odd scratching sounds from inside the walls as we drifted again into restless sleep. The next week brought further unease. While cleaning, I noticed the carved pagan symbol shifting ever so faintly. Sam admitted experiencing strange vertigo spells near the handsome cabinet increasingly dominating our room with imposing aura. We even caught shadowy masses hovering strangely in corners behind the dresser blank glass panels upon second looks. Baffled and rattled by the escalating phenomena, we hesitantly researched the armoire's background using insignia clues, nervously joking about demons and having vintage furniture due to our cynicism. However, results yielded no wording simple matches mostly discussions on hidden chamber techniques used by smugglers or war refugees through the eras. A particularly clarifying chatter thread stood out. T 
Tales of makeshift cells or restraint cabinets built into larger furniture pieces. Horrified imagining more sinister implications, we peered behind the gussy glass doors and knew only to find ordinary shadow and vacancy within the expected deep compartments. I refused believing any spirits of human suffering haunted the wood we brought so eagerly into our nest and sacred bedchamber. Yet that night's screams shocked us awake. Bolting up in darkness, the bursts of agonized cries ceased as suddenly as they pierced the choking quiet. We leaped from tangled sheets scurrying for its source, flipping lights with trembling hands. But the dresser sat moodily inner under harsh bulbs, revealing nothing within its antique facade beyond cobwebs and corners. Neither slept again that endless night, sitting upright watching warily for manifestations as the previous homeowner's tale of night terrors echoed mockingly in my skepticism. But the antique remained annoyingly still and silent, almost taunting our darting eyes for signs of danger. Only later daylight revealed four deep scratches slicing clean through the hard oak back panel, too thick and seamless for casual vandal damage. My heart seized instantly. No animals had access to that corner overnight, positioned purposely to prevent our cat using it as a scratch pad, which left only one improbable source fathomable behind such brutal gouges. Spectral occupants contained dangerously within the handsome prison, we stationed arrogantly between us and unseen realms channeling rage or anguish too long. Sam demanded instantly junking the accursed thing, but a strange protectiveness toward the dresser now flooded me irrationally. I found myself yelling shrilly about financial waste destroying an expensive furniture investment simply through paranormal ignorance. Secretly, I harbored deeper dread of unleashing whatever desired so desperately clawing out behind those splintered gashes barely concealing inexplicable night shrieks. But San only grew more manic to remove the disturbance violating our newfound domestic security in this quaint cottage, so recently sheltering only hopes unchallenged by superstitious fears. I acceded begrudgingly to list the dented wardrobe online for rapid sale before whatever inhabited its confines, finished tearing through temporal reality's fragile film concealing ghastly secrets. Oh, a faint sense of regret trailed me while the battered oak antique lurched off in another unwitting buyer's truck bed, its true haunting origins perhaps forever shrouded now in buried village rumors warning against mysteries demanding deeper due diligence before claiming their cursed unknown so eagerly as our own. All right, selling folks, because I've got a story for you that's going to make your skin crawl. It all started when I was on the hunt for a new Xbox. I'm a hardcore gamer, and I've been saving up for months to get my hands on the latest and greatest model. I was scoring Craigslist every day, hoping to score a good deal. And then, one fateful afternoon, I saw it. An ad for a brand spanking new Xbox, still sealed in the box, and at a price that made my jaw drop. I couldn't believe my luck. I started daydreaming about all the epic gaming sessions I was going to have all the online tournaments I was going to dominate. I fired off a message to the seller right away, trying to play it cool even though my heart was racing with excitement. They got back to me quickly, saying that the Xbox was still available and that they were happy to sell it to me. So far, so good. But then things took a bit of a bizarre turn. The seller insisted on meeting up in the parking lot of a McDonald's. Not a mall, not a coffee shop, but a freaking McDonald's. I know, I know, it sounds sketchy as hell. Every instinct in my body was telling me to back out, to run away, and never look back. But the allure of that shiny new Xbox was just too strong. I convinced myself that the seller was just being cautious, that they probably had some bad experiences with Craigslist deals in the past. So, against my better judgment, I agreed to meet them there. The day of the meetup, I was a bundle of nerves. I kept checking my phone every five seconds, half expecting the seller to cancel on me. But they didn't, and so I found myself pulling into the McDonald's parking lot, my palms sweaty and my heart pounding. I spotted the seller right away. They were leaning against the most beat-up car I'd ever seen, smoking a cigarette and looking like they'd just rolled out of bed. I'm not one to judge a book by its cover, but something about this person just didn't sit right with me. They had this shifty look in their eyes, like they were up to no good. But I pushed my doubts aside and walked over to them. The cash clutched tightly in my hand. The seller barely acknowledged me as they pulled the Xbox box out of their car and practically tossed it into my arms. 
I handed over the money, and before I could even say thanks, they were peeling out of the parking lot like they had somewhere important to be. I couldn't wait to get home and fire up my new gaming system. I was practically drooling at the thought of all the new games I was going to play, all the virtual worlds I was going to explore. I may have even let out a little giggle of excitement as I placed the box gently in the passenger seat of my car. But oh, if only I had known what horrors waited me. If only I had listened to that little voice in the back of my head, the one that had been screaming at me to turn back from the moment I saw that sketchy Craigslist ad. When I got home, I rushed inside, eager to rip into the box and get started on my gaming marathon. But as soon as I lifted the lid, I knew something was very, very wrong. A foul scent wafted out, making my eyes water and my stomach churn. And there, nestled amongst the plastic wrap and cardboard, was the source of the smell. A dead squirrel, its little body stiff and cold, its glassy eyes staring up at me in an accusatory way. I let out a scream that probably woke up the whole neighborhood, dropping the box and stumbling backwards in shock. For a moment, I just stood there, my mind reeling, trying to process what I was seeing. Who in their right mind would do something like this? What kind of twisted, sadistic prank were they trying to pull? I felt sick to my stomach, violated in a way I'd never experienced before. With shaking hands, I managed to find some gloves and a garbage bag. I gingerly removed the squirrel from the box, gagging at the smell and the feel of its lifeless body. I sealed it up in the bag, double and triple knotting it, as if that would somehow erase the horror of what had just happened. I lugged the bag out to the dumpster, trying not to think about the poor little creature inside. As I heaved it into the trash, I couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt. This wasn't the squirrel's fault. It had just been an innocent victim, caught up in some psycho's sick game. Over the next few days, I became consumed with trying to track down the seller. I scored Craigslist, looking for any other ads they might have posted. I even considered going to the police, but I knew they'd probably just laugh in my face. I spent hours online, combing through forums and message boards, looking for anyone who might have had a similar experience. And eventually, I found a few other people who had been scammed by the same seller. They all had similar stories, a too-good-to-be-true deal, a sketchy meetup location, and a nasty surprise waiting for them when they got home. It was a small comfort, knowing that I wasn't alone. But it didn't erase the trauma of what had happened, the feeling of being violated and betrayed. I couldn't shake the image of that dead squirrel, the way its little body had felt in my hands. I wish I could say that I got some kind of closure that the seller was brought to justice and made to pay for their cruel prank. But the truth is, I never did find out who they were or why they did it. And in a way, maybe that's for the best. Maybe some mysteries are better left unsolved. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm a hell of a lot more careful about buying stuff online these days. I do my research, I ask for proof of purchase, and I always, always meet up in a public place. And if something seems too good to be true, I trust my gut and walk away. Because as much as I love gaming, as much as I love the thrill of scoring a great deal, it's not worth risking my sanity or my safety. It's not worth opening myself up to the kind of sick, twisted stuff that some people are capable of. So, if you're ever tempted to take a chance on a sketchy Craigslist ad, just remember my story. Remember the dead squirrel, the foul stench, the feeling of being violated in the trade. And ask yourself, is it really worth it? I've always loved old cinema. The glitz and glamour of classic Hollywood holds a special magic to me. So when I came across a Craigslist ad for vintage 35mm film reels from an abandoned movie theater, I leaped at the opportunity. The seller didn't provide any details on the film's contents, but I imagined lost gems forgotten in storage for decades just waiting to be revived. I messaged immediately to buy the whole lot. When the reels arrived on my doorstep, they far exceeded my expectations. Each canister bore the name of a different cinema that had closed before I was born. The Plaza, the Ritz, the Majestic. These were iconic theaters from cinema's golden age. What cinematic treasures might the reels contain? My mind raced with dazzling possibilities, sweeping romances, lavish musicals, screwball comedies led by Cary Grant himself. I itched to get the projector running right away for a glimpse into the past. I quickly set everything up in the basement, stacking musty canisters along the wall. 
I chose one canister simply marked the palace in faded gold letters. Gingerly extracting the film, I was surprised to find no labels or any indication of the contents. How odd not to mark the movie's title on the reels. But perhaps theater staff skipped that formality when Prince stayed in-house. I carefully threaded the film into the projector. The machine whirred soothingly at that magical movie theater scent of oil and celluloid filling the small basement. As I pulled the cover from the lens, dazzling light lit up the far wall. Transfixed, I sank into my seat just as the first frames flickered by. At first, everything looked normal. Countless faces of cinema patrons passed briskly by as the camera recorded the bustling lobby. But strangely, the timestamp read 1964. That would have made the footage nearly 60 years old if the image quality was crystal clear, lacking any of the scratches or dust that would have accumulated over decades. How bizarre was that? The puzzling timestamp soon slipped my mind as the film continued. Having panned across the lobby, the camera was now positioned outside the doors of the theater auditoriums, pointed straight at the unsuspecting moviegoers. I smiled seeing women dressed in pillbox hats and smart skirt suits. One waved excitedly to someone out of frame, her eyes shining under a stylish bob. But something about the woman gave me pause. She looked oddly, yearly familiar. I could swear I had seen that vibrant smile before, that distinctive glint of recognition in her eyes as she waved. Like subtle deja vu, the specifics lingered just out of reach in my mind. Where had I seen her? Who did she remind me of so uncannily? Before I could put the pieces together, the film cut abruptly to another radically different scene. Gone were the cheerful bright lights of the theater lobby, replaced suddenly by a dim clinical fluorescence. Stacked cubbies filled the walls and the timestamp on the film read three months later, July 1964. Two police officers walked down a narrow corridor, stopping at one of the many cubbies along the wall. Pulling open the small metal door released a cloud of icy vapor. As it cleared, a body came into view, a woman frozen rigid on Thicot within. My stomach dropped seeing the corpse's face. That vibrant smile, those shining eyes I had just seen only moments ago. It was the same woman from the theater lobby. Horrified, I watched the mystery play out frame by frame. The officers inspected the body, closely looking for clues to her demise. Around the woman's neck hung a silver butterfly necklace engraved with two letters. K and T, one officer, carefully bagged the necklace as evidence. Then the film cut abruptly again to a bright summer day months later in 1965. A local park bustled with families enjoying the sunshine. Children chased balls, couples strolled by. Then something at the edge of the frame caught my eye. There on a park bench sat a woman who looked eerily similar to the deceased woman from the morgue footage. I rewound the film hastily, my hands trembling. Comparing the two women, I confirmed the resemblance. That same vibrant smile on her face watching the children play. It was definitely the same woman. The woman police had declared dead months earlier. Unease swirled inside me. How was she here after her death? Why had the theater footage captured her demise? I frantically pulled another canister off the shelf. This one marked simply the Art Deco Theater. The mystery only grew stranger. This reel began innocently capturing groups of friends entering the grand old movie palace to see a show. As they streamed through the lobby, I peered closely at the patrons' joyful faces, nervous one might trigger some dark deja vu. Sure enough, one smiling man looked familiar. That strong jaw, the wrinkles around his eyes when he smiled. I racked my brain trying to place him. Like a thunderbolt, it struck me. That was Uncle Rick, a mom's older brother who died when I was a little girl. But how could a dead uncle of mine show up on films from an abandoned theater? Heart racing, I kept watching with morbid anticipation. Just like the previous theater, this innocuous lobby footage suddenly cut to a grisly new scene. A car mangled around a tree, the metal warped and streaked with blood. Emergency responders swarmed the vehicle, carefully cutting out the driver trapped inside. And there was Uncle Rick behind the wheel, cuts on his face but somehow still breathing. Medics quickly loaded him into an ambulance as he faded in and out of consciousness. Then the film abruptly cut again to a police station years later in 1978. I watched in horror as officers wheel a woman through booking, her head down and face obscured by a hat. They led her into a holding room and made her remove the hat. I almost monitored seeing her face. She looked exactly like my Aunt Barbara, 
Uncle Rick's wife. What was Aunt Barbara doing arrested by police years after burying Uncle Rick? Dizzy with shock, I stopped the projector by whole body quaking. These films didn't contain forgotten cinema treasures. They held forgotten lives. Secret histories of ordinary people that somehow foretold their deaths. What fate awaited them in those small canisters? Car crashes? Murders? The labels bore names but no dates. Were the deaths upcoming or already set in stone years earlier? How had a footage captured people's fate with eerie precision? I stared around my basement at the stacks of films, the gears turning to unlock their macabre mystery. What forgotten souls might flicker across my wall? And what deadly fates did the reels foretell for them? I was in a tight spot after college. My bank account dwindled as I scored websites daily, applying to any relevant job posting I could find. The mountain of rejection emails in my inbox grew higher while my hopes sank lower. Bills were piling up. If I didn't find work soon, I didn't know how I'd make rent. Just as desperation peaked, I stumbled upon a peculiar Craigslist ad. Administrative assistant needed. $30 slasher. That hourly rate for an admin role. Unheard of. The listing itself provided scant details, simply stating a small tech company sought part-time help with data entry, email correspondence, and miscellaneous office tasks. It seemed almost too good to be true. I had my reservations. Short, vague job posts often hid something sinister. But $30 an hour? I couldn't pass that up. I submitted my resume and cover letter feeling a small rush of hope. Maybe this could end my job hunt woes. The company, Teller Innovations, got back to me the very next morning asking to schedule an interview. Before I knew it, I sat across from my potential new boss, a woman named Ms. Gabriella Teller. Gabriella exuded a polished charm, her smile never faltering. She said they needed someone detail-oriented who could maintain discretion to help support a growing startup. The role itself sounded easy enough, and Gabriella assured me flexibility to work part-time hours from home. I would have been a fool not to take the opportunity. Gabriella brought me aboard right away. She ramped up my duties rapidly, having me onboard new clients almost exclusively via email. I was in and out of the virtual office, the work almost suspiciously easy for $30 an hour. But it was a job, and I needed one badly. I decided not to question my good fortune. Then the Mazar requests started trickling in. Gabriella asked me to compile peculiar data sets, home addresses from around the country paired with people's greatest hopes, dreams, and personal fears. She gave no explanation why Teller Innovations would need such personal data. Said it was proprietary work aimed at improving customer experience through psychological modeling. Her blue eyes glinted sharply even through the computer screen, daring me to probe further. I willfully ignored my growing unease. The pay was too good, the work too steady in my empty bank account. But when Gabriella asked me to pull up a client's deepest, darkest secrets and code them into a database for influence mapping, Cold alarm bells rang in my mind. I stared blankly at my screen, cursor pulsing faintly. Gabriella's interest in clients' personal demons crossed a line from questionable over to outright sinister. I could no longer ignore that Teller Innovations wasn't what it seemed on the surface. I started digging. Turns out no record existed of a company called Teller Innovations. Gabriella's digital footprint was nearly non-existent save for a sparse LinkedIn profile. As I searched for signs of foul play, I grasped at innocent explanations. Clerical error. Intentionally obscure startup practices. But when I tried accessing files Gabriella herself had shared on our VPN, I found the folders wiped clean. Panic rose in my chest. Who was Gabriella Teller? Who did I actually work for? How had they found me in the first place? Were they using my labor to exploit people against their will? Questions and scenarios far worse barraged my thoughts before settling on the mysterious job listing that started this nightmare. I frantically opened a private browsing window to recheck the Craigslist ad. But the listing had vanished without a trace my browser history wiped clean of it. Ghost job for a ghost company. My blood ran cold realizing I had become entangled in something profoundly unethical at best and possibly outright illegal. No legitimate business pays that much for glorified data entry. Gabriella's intentions became gut-wrenchingly clear. 
Targeting people's secret fears could be catastrophically dangerous in the wrong hands. I sat paralyzed at my desk, my palms sweating, mind racing about what nightmare I had stepped into. Who was Gabriella Teller? Who was behind Teller Innovations? What were they really doing with people's data? Were they targeting the vulnerable? Blackmailing people worse. Any explanation ended terribly. Gabriella had reeled me in when I was desperate. A perfect mark blinded by dollar signs, willing to ignore red flags. At least until it was too late. Until I had enabled whatever schemes Gabriella and her court had planned. I needed to cut ties and fast, but simply quitting struck me as dangerously foolish when I still had no clue what Gabriella Teller was capable of. Would she let me walk away unscathed? Could I take that risk? My phone buzzed with a new message. Gabriella asked me to hop on a call, said she had an exciting new project to discuss. Bile burned in my throat. I knew that I couldn't keep working for her for even one more day. But how to get out of this unscathed? If I rejected Gabriella outright, would I face consequences? Would she threaten me into silence if I tried to blow the whistle? I realized all my personal data was also in her hands, my entire digital footprint exposed. I needed help, expert lawyerly help, but I had barely two nickels to rub together, let alone hire legal counsel. Unless, in a flash it hit me, turn the tables on Gabriella, I would trick her into revealing what she was really after. Get evidence to bring to the proper authorities. Let law enforcement sort out this gnarled mystery once I escaped safely away. I took a deep breath and clicked accept me invite on Gabriella's proposal, my mouth trembling slightly. Time to beat Gabriella at her own game. She reeled me in my was vulnerable and desperate. Now fear would motivate me to turn predator into prey. My poverty and misfortune brought me to Gabriella, but those same pressures would give me the tools and motivation to take her down instead. When I stumbled onto the Craigslist ad seeking youth brand reps for double the normal salary plus benefits, it seemed a godsend. I was struggling through my fifth fruitless interview month post-graduation, my bank account dwindling rapidly. Rent demanded paying somehow before the grace period expired, so despite my wariness, I applied, instantly hoping for a long-shot callback. The very next morning, I received an enthusiastic video call from a poised older woman named Ms. Vega. Her executive persona and rapid hiring offer calmed all hesitations given my financial nosedive. I scarcely glanced at the detailed contract before signing digitally too anxious to start replenishing income after so much rejection. The company named Verticor rang no alarm bells amidst desperation for this sophisticated lifeline. Orientation week flew by, luxury corporate headquarters belying any unease about Vay Wellness product marketing described for wealthier clientele. My savvy associate close scoffed when I asked about the active ingredients we pushed so aggressively each day from upscale offices. Sweetie, results come from mindset. We provide that for a premium. These people value exclusivity, not nuts and bolts. Her confidence quelled my doubts, thrilled at last to leverage skills for an elite cause. Soon I earned top monthly sales recruiting newer social media followings to sample Verticorp's glow. My commission soared as I touted the brand daily across platforms. Feedback showed clients losing weight, looking younger, feeling happiest. They had in years, and the more their expensive habit took hold, the more lavish rewards Ms. Vega bestowed upon her star peddlers. But over time, ethical red flags waved ceaselessly in mind. Why the exorbitant prices for relatively normal high-end cosmetics? And why were head office quarters always empty whenever I received praise for record conversions? Any stat visible appeared sullen and mechanical. The disconnected vibe unsettled until close said corporate secrecy maintained their aura of unmatched mystique protecting the brand. Her justifications settled in easily while I ignored my conscience for self-preservation. The facade first cracked months later, when Ms. Vega urgently summoned me into an ominous steel elevator descending to subbasement levels I never knew existed at Verticorp. Nerves spiked entering a sterile white chamber filled with medical equipment and grim technicians. Before I could protest, they strapped me forcibly into a complex neural scanning cylinder while Ms. Vega stood observing behind a glass partition. Panic flooded my trapped body as receptors stimulated a nightmarish flood of childhood memories relived as if trapped in my own vetted brain scans. 
I recognized then the true business model I was peddling. Vertacorp's founders developed neuromapping to read and project clients' most painful mental states. Then, promising relief, they put the wealthy and suggestible onto seticonic patterns and triggers algorithmically designed by mining subscribed minds. A twisted cycle transmuting suffering into fortunes by dealing upgraded trauma like a drug. Days later, I awoke logged as Subject 12B, my body bruised and brain fuzzy from lingering needles and electrodes. Ms. Vega stood smugly above my anguished hospital bed, her impeccable appearance cracking to reveal the monster lurking behind. Surprise, my protege. We had such delightfully painful memories to unpack in that exquisite mind of yours. Almost a shame you stumbled upon our little mind-reading operation down there. But every good story needs courageous heroines who learn too much. She grinned wickedly then, caressing instruments glinting under harsh lighting. Not to worry, I am simply preparing you for a final vivid Vertacorp experience our treasured clients will value highly. We always over-deliver on our promises for total mental and physical transformation. You'll pioneer our greatest achievement once I implant these neural collection devices streaming your delicious trauma directly into their brains for that highly coveted first-hand suffering high. I strained against vices and tubes fruitlessly, shrieking as the machinery roared to life. Then my vision exploded into searing white heat before going black, Ms. Veda's manic laughter echoing with promises to personally savor the intimate live feed as I endured this slow, digitized torment no contract's fine print could ever have prepared me for. Vertacorp's best clients would surely laud her for procuring agony so newly dripping and freshly harvested beyond all legal means. I've loved Harry Potter since childhood. The books brought me to a magical world where anything seemed possible. As an adult, I still revisit the films to recapture that nostalgic wonder, despite having the entire series memorized. So when I saw a DVD collection on Craigslist for only $20, I messaged the seller instantly. They must be desperate to part with such a treasure. We arranged to meet that evening at a coffee shop. I arrived early, tropically excited, and soon enough spotted a gangly teen lugging an overstuffed backpack. He heaved it onto the table with a dramatic thunk that made me wince for the DUDs inside. But the bag held carefully packed cases showing the first six Potter film titles all intact and accounted for. I felt a rush of childlike glee seeing those familiar covers right there in front of me. The seller apologized for the worn condition, but, as expected, every disc played flawlessly on his laptop. Twenty dollars seemed almost criminal for these gems. We exchanged cash and he dashed off to catch his bus leave me culling my new box set in pure contentment. Back home, I meticulously arranged the DVDs on the shelf by ear just as on book spines lined up in my childhood bedroom. The collection looked perfect, except disc 5 which bore not the Order of the Phoenix, but a cryptic black disc labeled simply, The Lost Film. Puzzled, I examined it closely but found no other markings. The seller definitely photographed Phoenix as part of the set, so what happened here? Why replace it with this mystery disc? Curiosity overwhelmed me. I have to know what secrets this surprise disc might reveal. I inserted the disc, the familiar electronic whirring oddly foreboding. But menus loaded normally and hit play just like any commercial release. Harry appeared on screen slightly younger than I remembered. He walked cautiously through dark, empty Hogwarts halls by wand plate. But no dialogue sounded only an ominous, droning musical score I didn't recognize. The Harry Potter title never appeared either. What kind of amateur video was this? Unease crept further as the plot unfolded strangely, completely diverging from the novels. Harry encountered not friends, but shadow enemies whose faces remained obscured. They pursued him relentlessly through the castle, no matter what spells he cast. Even at dead ends, they'd materialize from stone itself, as if Hogwarts conspired against him. Dark wizardry seemed at play I could not comprehend. The tension finally broke when Harry dashed outside onto the Quidditch pitch, thinking himself free. But a silhouette awaited him there, tall, thin, and familiar. Professor Quirrell, but facing forward, not trembling timidly. And where was his absurd turban? Harry shouted desperately, but only distant thunder echoed in response. My skin crawled, realizing Quirrell lacked his usual nervous stutter, too. This character was something far more sinister wearing Quirrell's face. When the figure raised his wand, I gasped seeing the actor's eyes. 
They glowed bright blue instead of Quirrell's warm brown. Harry reacted with moral terror, fleeing into the forbidden forest, branches tearing his clothes, and face to bloody scrapes. He twisted his ankle badly mid-sprint, but adrenaline kept him crashing forward heedless of pain over direction. The animal sounds of the forest fell dead silent save Harry's wheezing breath. A dark sorcery was clearly at work. Just when it seemed Harry might elude his pursuer, he burst into a familiar forest clearing. My heart dropped. There stood the dark sorcerer next to poor unicorns dripping silver blood, their ghostly eyes dim and empty. The dark figure approached Harry slowly, deliberately, as the wounded unicorns shuddered with dying breath. Even for a fabricated plot, this seemed sadistically cruel. I sat petrified, watching helplessly as the dark man raised his wand once more. But instead of words, an eldritch screech erupted from his mouth in a language no human tongue could form. I covered my ears panicked but could not block the sound now audible inside my own head. Harry reacted similarly, crying out and clutching his forehead where jagged red cracks formed in the crude shape of a lightning bolt, Voldemort's mark. Growing from Harry's head that raw woven blood openly, framing his face in viscous scarlet. Those unnatural cries steadily amplified. Thunder crashed symphonically overhead building to a fever pitch, harrowing even through the TV speakers. Each wail carried profound violence and rage, primal loathing for life itself. Harry sank, powerless onto the rotted earth before that sonic assault, shielding his fracturing skull in agony. Voldemort's scar pulsed wildly now, destroying him cell by cell. The sound resonated somewhere impossibly deep both on screen and inside my quivering body. I'd give anything to silence it. When Harry finally collapsed into merciful unconsciousness, his scar erupted in a geyser of blood. That shrieking reached its apex, destroying him from inside before cutting abruptly silent. The breach in Harry's head took on unnatural dimensions, deep and gaping with edges that dripped upwards. All laws of nature now in question, blood trickled upwards defying gravity itself towards the black form waiting patiently above Harry's mangled body. The dark one carefully filled crystal vials from that inverted fountain of plasma with a look of triumph. When the flow eventually ceased, he cast those glowing rubies aside casually. Harry did not stir, his light extinguished behind eyes now dim and cracked like the broken unicorns. The dark man whispered an incantation which shook the forest violently. Trees splintered raging while the earth shrieked in what sounded now like cackling laughter. As the ground yawned open, the stranger grasped limp Harry by his mop of raven hair, dragging him to the crumbling precipice. Holding Harry aloft like macabre tribute, he addressed the blood-washed bones clattering from their ancient graves to encircle the clearing. The chris like imagery bore obscene perversion. What unholy covenant was this? With his ghastly attendants looking up, the pale king extended one long, sharp nail and delicately carved a sigil into the dead boy's forehead. That design seemed to shift maddeningly before my eyes. At once resembled the hallow symbol, but then a Christian cross marred by additional geometry. Harry did not stir even as blood again poured down his face. When the bloody task finally finished, Black Form bundled Harry carelessly under one arm and then turned to face the camera for the first time. Under that deep hood, eyes of horrid sapphire burned towards me. Ancient cunning and seething joy morphed into surprise, sensing somehow my presence observing through the screen. In this unguarded instant, I glimpsed the face barely hidden beneath that cowl and instantly vomited seeing the grotesque visage that should never be viewed by human eyes. Some primal self-preservation immediately blocked a full revelation from my conscious mind. But that fleeting glimpse ingrained soul deep terror no amount of therapy may ever exorcise. I neither moved nor breathed nor barely existed for untold time afterward. May as well have glimpsed Medusa herself. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.